Hi guys, today we're going to be reacting to scuba diving tips on YouTube Shorts and TikTok. I guess both platforms, because most creators nowadays are going to optimise by putting on both platforms just to have it more available, so yeah, both. <laughs> and I'm going to be giving my opinion on the videos, I'm going to add in any of my thoughts to it, if I think it's good, bad, or maybe something I think it's maybe completely wrong. Just using my professional opinion, being a scuba diving instructor. Quick disclaimer, I did double check these videos by watching the first few seconds of them just to make sure they are tip videos because I didn't want to accidentally watch just some guy's random um, scuba diving footage. <laughs> and it's like, I'm going, hmm, that could be better. And it's just him trying to have a good time and I come across like an absolute jerk. So these are actual genuine tip videos I'm gonna be reacting to. <laughs> also, I'm aware from my own experience having a one minute time limit can be quite restrictive to talk about very complex scuba topics. So I even can assume, even if I like the video, I might still expand on the point because there might be other things that need to be covered and just trying to discuss something with a lot of nuance in one minute can be a bit of an awkward one and things get missed out. So that's probably what I might do for a lot of things. So even when I do agree, I still might expand. It's not me being negative, it's just me purely going, I think this should be included as well, just for full understanding of a topic. Without out of the way, let's jump into the videos. So first video, let's go. Hey Marcel. Hey, what's up? You got any tips for night diving? Absolutely, I got three oh, tips nice. to enjoy your night dives a lot better. Tip number one, go really, really nice and slow okay. under the water and go really nice and close with your torch to yeah. the reef. Makes then you effective. can see the reef in its original colors. It's absolutely amazing, I like the rainbow. Just make sure, of course, that you don't touch that reef because we Good need night. to take care of that delicate aquatic life. All right, tip number two. Tip number two is to take the torch off at one point and then you start moving your hands and you can actually play with the bioluminescence essence yeah. when you move through the water, creating this incredible fireworks show around you. And tip number three, talking about torches, I highly recommend you to get this amazing torch called the Orca Torch D710. And if you want one of these babies, click the three dots above yeah, and in the description you'll find a link to get your own. Let's go night diving. Okay, let's take these headphones out. I actually really like the video. Um, night diving is really cool. I would definitely give it a go if you've never tried it before because it's a completely different experience to just daytime diving. Firstly, just because different marine life's out because some come out because time of the night when they go hunting. So some things like eels, for example, which are typically quite inactive during daytime, they are a lot more active at nighttime and you can see them swimming around. So really cool to experience the ocean in a different way. So fully support night diving. But he's absolutely spot on with his first tip. Go slower, stay closer to your buddies and also stay close to the reef. The idea is because you have less visibility, you need to stay, go slower so you don't crash into anything. Stay close to your buddies so you can share torchlight and be close to the reef so the torches are more powerful and you can see clearer. Because if you're too far away from the reef, it's gonna be just torch going into the abyss and not being able to see much at all. I will say just a little bonus tip on that one is when you are shining torches, avoid shining them in the eyes of any marine life because that can startle them or ruin their night vision. Because this is the time of night they are hunting if they're active at that time and you're kind of disturbing that. When we're in the ocean, we're visitors, we're not there to disturb the animals. Yeah, second tip, that's the bioluminescence. I love this one. I used to always brief this as well when we were going for night dives. I would always say that I did, we do it at the safety stop. So once you get to the five meters, I would tell everyone to put the torches into their chest and that way then everyone's torches off at the same time and you have the most effective way of seeing the bioluminescence because if some people's torches are still out, it can disrupt it and not be as um, effective, intense, clear, <laughs> all those kind of things. So if you have like a synchronized time in the dive, as I, I personally like to do it at safety stop, it just makes it a really good way that you can all share the experience together and see the bioluminescence. But 100% check that out if you do a night dive, it's a really cool thing. Oh, just remember the extra point actually I want to add in about the um, bioluminescence. I also recommend just turn the torch to your chest. That way then you don't have to worry about turning it on and off because a lot of the torches I've used in the past are swivel tops and you can actually unscrew the torch and if you do that, it sometimes floods the torch if you unscrew it. So it's better just to tell people to just turn it towards the chest so they accidentally unscrew the torch, turn it off or open it up and get it flooded and break the torch. So personally, I always make it go towards my chest. That way I just know the torch is fine. There's gonna be no issues. And the final point about to torches, I don't know how good orca torches are. I never use them myself, but I'm sure they're great. Um, but having your own torch is always good. You then have a backup. Obviously you get one from renting, but it's always good to have a backup in case one breaks. Don't know if it has to be auger torches, <laughs> you can go for different brands. Um, do a bit of research yourself, but often I find even the cheap ones are pretty good for night dives. And it's only if you're going to things like cave diving or technical diving where you're going very deep, where you're going to need the more powerful torches. Most night dives you will do are typically shallow dives until you go maybe more experienced or do something more complicated. 
So you don't really need the most powerful one if you want to get your own torch. But honestly, great video, loved it. Okay, next video. Here's three easy steps to make sure you get the mask that fits you properly. Okay. The most important feature of your mask is that it fits you properly so it doesn't leak and is comfortable. Yep. Step number True. one, always remove the mask strap so you don't accidentally cool. force the seal. Step number two, you're gonna place it on your face, wiggle it around, and make yeah. sure there's no gaps on the silicone so yeah, it actually fits your face. And then step three, you place it on your face, breathe in through your nose and hold your breath to make sure that it holds the seal. Good old inhale test. Not every <laughs> mask is gonna fit the same, so make sure you go to your local dive shop and try a few on to make sure you get yeah. the best fit. That's good. Um, yeah, I <laughs> agree and some disagrees. So. One thing I will say, I've never been told to take off mask straps in a dive shop when trying on masks. I personally just think that's a wasted step. You don't need to. You can just, if you need to do the inhale test like you showed, just have the strap dangling down below your face or above your face. It's fine. And just for the simple fact that when I go to try on masks, or most people when they try on masks, you're gonna try on probably half a dozen, maybe a dozen, maybe even 20 odd masks if you're unlucky and not find a good one for you. And that's a lot of straps to take off and that's gonna be a lot of time the clerk's gonna have to put those straps back on and I think they're going to be quite annoyed at you by the end of the time if you are doing this. So personally, I would say don't do that because it's going to wind people up and it doesn't really change the experience. Um, second step point he talks about was when having the mask on, make sure there's no creases in the film and stuff. That is completely fine. Make sure it is properly sealed. I would recommend using a mirror for that though or have someone with you to check, make sure there's no hair or anything trapped. But just having a mirror is usually a good way of just doing that. And third step, the inhale test, that's just obviously, it's a, it's a standard one. I was showing this when I was finding my first mask. It's one everyone tells you to do any scuba shop. It's solid advice. The only one I would always add in there is while I was doing like a wiggle test. So put the mask on and then move your head around and see if the mask slides at all or whatnot. And that's a good way of seeing if it's a good fit for you as well. And also just make sure it's not pressing against things like your forehead, nose, cheeks, again, if you've got very big cheekbones. Um, but the idea is you just want to make sure those are ways to make sure a mask is comfortable. And yeah, as you said, if you find the mask that fits you perfectly, that's the most important thing over how it looks and stuff like that. If you find a good fitting mask, it can last you for life. So definitely good to do. Okay, third video, let's go. Oh. Frequently, as a scuba diving instructor, my male students ask me, what do I do if I have a beard <laughs> and my mask doesn't seal? Oh, Vaseline. Well, there's a very easy trick. Yeah. You just have to shave oh. two millimeters just below your nose and the mask will seal much better right okay. away. Okay. <laughs> the shaka, I love it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about this then. I've not heard that tip before, but I like that tip. Um, in the past, I'd always give people free advices, free tips for if you have problems with beards. Now I have a fourth one, so that's great. So the first one I always give people is just shave it all off. Go clean shaving if it's annoying you that your mask leaks because of your facial hair. That just gets rid of the problem. If you are someone who does have facial hair and you want to keep the facial hair, the thing what a lot of my friends who are very beardy, like much more than myself who just have a little bit of moustache. <laughs> What they recommend is having Vaseline. It works for them, it creates that seal, it makes it just very comfortable. The third option, which is the one I personally like to do, is find a mask that fits my face, even with a bit of facial hair, and that way then it's completely fine. And if it leaks a little bit, you just clear it. It's not a big deal. But fourth one, yeah, shave that top bit off, that can work. I will just say I think a lot of people who have facial hair, they have it because they like how it looks on them. And by altering how it looks by shaving the top part of it off, it might not look so good on you anymore. And then it kind of defeats the point of even having facial hair. But if you've never done that kind of moustache look before, give it a go. Maybe it'll suit you. And maybe it's a thing where you go, hey, I'm a diver because I have this kind of moustache. I know there's guys out there who love having that conversation starter and people are like, oh, nice moustache. And he's like, it's because I'm a diver. Nice watch. Oh, it's because that's my dive computer. Hey, nice t-shirt. Yeah, it's my scuba t-shirt. There's people like that, they like to have that conversation, they love to chat about dive for ages with people, and they love having this kind of entry point conversations. I don't know if that's just the divers I've met, but it's one of those things out there. It's cool. But yeah, I like this tip. I always like other options out there, I give people more accessibility and options when it comes to diving. It's really cool to have different variations, so all for that. Next video. Let's go. Today I have a quick tip for you on how to improve your air consumption. Okay. Implement this on your next dive and you will increase your bottom time. Perfect. And what is that? It is to stop moving. <laughs> yes. 
stop、okay. moving. And why? Because more movement equals more air used. You don't、mm -hmm. want to be the Energizer Bunny down there. You want to use the minimum amount of movement. Yeah,、possible. minimum amount. Now it's natural when you first start diving, you're going to be fidgeting down there. You're going to be playing with、mm -hmm. your BC, etc. And it's very common. All new divers do it. But I want you to be aware of your movement at all times. And when you find yourself making unnecessary movement. Stop. Remember,、True. less movement equals less air used. Now it's simple, but you will be amazed at the difference it does make. So on your next dive, think: Am I being the Energizer Bunny, or am I being Buddha? <laughs> That's good. Okay, I love that advice. It's one of very simple tips, which will, as you said, will save you air consumption a lot, and it help you, especially if you're a new diver. You have lots of these bad habits, you're not even really realizing, moving your hands weirdly or. Not being up to positions and stuff, and just stopping your movements is a really good thing. I also like the idea of like thinking, am I an energizer bunny versus am I Buddha? That's just fantastic. I used to always tell people, you want to act like、um, a spy underwater, going stealthy and covert, not bringing any attention to yourself, being super relaxed, instead of the lunatic flailing about like a dead fish. <laughs> That's the kind of comparisons I made. But it's good to have a visual for people who are visual learners or don't quite grasp things typically. So having that kind of visual does help. Um, but as I say, just killing unnecessary movements—it's it, crazy how much that will save your air consumption. So definitely,、um, if you are someone still trying to learn it, I did do a tips video just to show this little plug. But in that, I mentioned about how just having one hand over the other to stop your hands moving or crossing your arms can help stop using unnecessary movements with your hands. Again, just make sure you're in that flat trim position, not reducing your drag. Having good fitting techniques, so you're not just wasting energy by constantly kicking. And if you're doing like a drift dive, as she says, like. Zero movement is actually pretty ideal for drift dives where you don't have to move at all. But the nuance to what she says: don't completely do no movement because that's not entirely true when it comes down to、um, scuba. If you're going somewhere where there's either zero current and you obviously have to kick to move, so if you want to get to some point, going completely zero movement actually going to not get you anywhere. So if you do zero movement, you're just going to be stuck there like a potato, just hanging out. Um, but also, if it's like a, there's a little bit of current, and you, you need to either swim into current first and then go back with the current, there's obviously going to be a level of、um, kicking needed to be done there. So the zero movement is not exactly true, but as you said, minimal movements, being very efficient, very important. It'll help your air consumption, make you more relaxed on the dive as well, and that's just going to make you have an all-round better experience. So some great advice there. Love that. Next video, let's go. Whenever you go diving, consider carrying a dive knife.、Yep. That way, if you ever find any rope or fishing line on the coral, you can use it to cut it off. Also, look for a dive knife with a metal backing、okay. on it. That way, if you ever need to get your buddy's attention, you can take that backing and wrap、oh, it against your tank, tank <laughs> to make a bell-like tone and get your buddy's attention. Yeah, that's a thing. Okay. <clears throat> So, 100% will agree. Having a dive knife is a great safety tool.、Um, not probably the first thing you need to get as a new diver. Your instructor or guide should always have a knife on them, so they can help you cut you out of situations. But it's always good for you to have personally to get you out of potential entanglements if you are somewhere with lots of ghosts lying lying around or potential rope hazards. So it's always a safety thing. What's always worth having.、Um, you don't need a big knife like you showed there. Like just a small little cutting device would be great. And if you know it's going to be mostly ghost lines, I have friends who just use safety scissors. Literally, just some safety scissors they just have attached to them, and they can just do that. Oh, there goes my mic. And one thing I will just add to that as well is that just make sure when you have your knife, don't have it on like your wrist or on an ankle. Make sure it's somewhere where both hands can get to, somewhere like on your chest or in a pocket spot, because let's say your arm got entangled there and it's on your left wrist, you're going to have a hard time trying to reach that knife there. So. Having it on your chest is going to be, make it a lot easier for you to access or in the pocket. That's just a good piece of advice.、Um, as for the one on the metal end, that's fine. I guess having like an extra signaling device is always handy. Personally, I hate tank bangers. I think they're too noisy. Flashback. But realistically, these things suck. They are so loud. They're so obnoxious. Yes, even though you can signal with them, you signal the whole dive site. You don't just signal your group. You signal everyone there. You scare away wildlife. They're obnoxious. Don't get this thing, but they are what they are. We'll just mention if you are going to use a signaling device or it's a thing you commonly use, just add it to your diving brief or mention it in the diving brief. So this is how I signal people: either be a double-ended clip or be the knife there. That way, people know it to snap to that specific sound to know it's you trying to get their attention. That's just always be handy. But yeah, fully agree. 
knife is a very useful piece of tool to have and it can definitely help you get out of bad situations. So having a, a knife is very useful and they are pretty affordable as well. So there's not like a reason why you shouldn't have one really, especially if you are going up in the diving ranks, if you're looking to become a dive master or an actual instructor as well, this is something you're gonna need to have anyway. So it's always gonna be useful. Okay, and the final video, headphones back in. Let's go. Why scuba divers can't share air with snorkelers. Okay. This sounds crazy. If you're a scuba diver and you're 30 feet down and a snorkeler comes to you and he's like, I need air, share air. You cannot give him air. That sounds terrible. You're just gonna watch this man die. If you give him air, you could cause him to die because snorkelers are used to holding their yeah. breath. The number one rule of scuba diving is not to hold your breath. Long story short, if you give this snorkeler air and he takes off to the surface while holding his breath, this Lugate compressed expansion. air from your scuba Lugate. cylinder will expand his yeah. lungs until he has a lung over expansion injury so you could kill him by sharing air the best thing you can do is say no back up and watch him you can watch him and if he doesn't make it to the top if he has a shallow water blackout grab him take him up uh, initiate the life-saving procedures that you should know if you're scuba diving this is why you don't share air with snorkelers oh this is my probably most mixed one then okay there's a lot of layers to this. Um, let's think how I'm going to start talking about this. Okay, the first thing, let's talk about this, is that this scenario should never happen. Um, when people are free diving and people are scuba diving, they shouldn't be mixing together. Um, free divers stick to themselves, scuba divers stick, stick to themselves. There shouldn't be really any interaction underwater with you guys together. Um, if there is, it's like usually think like a photo shoot or something like that. I've done that in the past, but that's a very specific thing, and I don't want to go into that tangent because it just makes it comp more complicated. Um, but if they are a good free diver, same as scuba diving, they'll be doing it for buddy. There'll be someone watching out for them. The scenario of them running out of air or needing you use an air supply never happens. They have someone who's watching out for them, so if they can't make it back to surface, they have a shallow water blackout. There'll be a free diver with them who will help them go back to surface. So if this no even to happen means they're being reckless and free diving on their own. But more than that, they also are being really a jerk to you, forcing you into this bad situation. Um, I think that's kind of layers because there's like an assumptions being made with the video because it's one of those weird ones. So let's go along with his assumption first and that's gonna make it more sense. But so you, you meet this free diver down at 30 meters and I think it's not that they're out of there, it's they're in control and they just think it'd be funny to get you um, a breath off a red scuba set. They think, oh, this is hilarious, probably just some quite new to free diving, a bit cocky. And him saying, tell them no, don't let them ha have your air, that's completely fine. Because the moment they take air from you, they are no longer free diving, they are going to be scuba diving with you. And that's when you have to make contact and make sure they stay with you. They cannot go straight up, as they say, you can't hold his breath because that will cause a lung over expansion injury because he mentioned 30 feet, which is about 10 meters roughly for everyone else who's not American. Um, so you're down on two atmospheres of um, pressure there. So if you go to the surface, your lungs, the volume inside your lungs will expand two times. So from a full breath of air there, you'll have your lungs over expand twice and that will cause a rupture and leave them in a bad way and probably need to get some emergency services to help him out with that. So. Because of that, and because you don't know if they are scuba trained and stand scuba, you can't just let them have a breath and then go on the merry way about it. Because if, as he said, if they hold their breath, they can end up in a very bad situation. So they're kind of stuck with you at that, that point, but they're locked into scuba diving. And as you as a scuba diver, you want to be conservative, you want to be safe. You are then lost to redundancy, which is your alternate or octopus. And because of that, you're going to have to end your dive. It doesn't matter what stage you're in it's reckless to continue diving or want to go deeper at that point you need to be looking at ending the dive so get your buddy to deploy dsmb do go, to, go towards the surface either do a safety stop if it's um if you need to or just go straight to the surface if you haven't been diving very long at all before the scenario happens but really it's a bit of a dick move by the free diver because it forces your dive to end prematurely and it's not really a good situation so the free diver is completely in the wrong if that happens and it's not okay now, the whole thing is saying like, give me air, I'm out of air scenario. And then he's having a conversation like, no, you can't do that free diver. Remember, we can't share air. Naughty, naughty, you need to go up. That conversation does not happen. You do not have this conversation with a free diver underwater who is out of air. The realistic scenario is it's someone who's probably inexperienced as a free diver, or maybe they don't even free dive. They're just someone who's a snorkeler. They thought, oh, I've seen this on YouTube or TikTok about free diving. So they're giving it a go. They've gone a bit deeper than they expected, down to like 30 feet or 10 meters. 
and they realized, oh God, I might not be able to get back to the surface right now, but they spot you who are just a few feet away, and like, oh, that's close air supply. And when people are in that panic state, they're stressed, they think they're kind of worried they might die. They don't really think about the logical things or the impact of others, they get quite selfish. So they're just gonna go for you as an air source. So there's no amount of conversation you go, no, 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 or wagging your finger at them sort of thing. They're just going to go straight for you. Again, if they've got no scuba diving training, they might not even know about an alternate, so they might go straight for your primary, rip out your mouth, steal that. And this could go really south really fast because they could obstruct you to get to your alternate to breathe off that. They could damage the primary and cause it to free flow because they yanked it so hard and messed up how they've pulled it out. It can become a dangerous situation, not just for them, but also for you. And it's such having one person potentially drowning, it can be also both of you now drowning and it becomes even more complicated just to save both of you. So I think there's really two things you should do if it is someone who genuinely is out of air and they are coming to you for air. <laughs> and the first one is basically create distance between self. So that's by turning your fins towards where they are, kicking away so you're further away from them or even, even descending when you're going to do this as well making it more harder to get to, making it more unappealing for them to make get, get to you as to so get to your air. So then it becomes more appealing for them to go back to the surface. And that's option one. It's not the best option, but it's more if you spot them late, like you got blindsided slightly, they suddenly just pounce on you. That's one thing you do to get yourself away from them and get them to back off. But it's not great because as I say, if they are generally gonna run out of air, they might then try to get to the surface. They might not successfully get there. They might have a shallow water blackout. And if they don't have a free diving buddy with them, it kind of falls on you if, to take responsibility. If instead of just letting someone drown, it can be on you to get them back to surface. Now, just to clarify when he said all scuba divers can do this, I don't fully agree with him on that one. It's only people who are rescue trained and above. And even just being a rescue diver, I don't think rescue divers realistically, it's all in theory and it's like simulations. In real life, these situations do not pan out the same way. And it's also a free diver, not a scuba diver. So you don't have a BCD to mess around with, which can be a little bit fiddly, but on the surface it's more helpful so it can be a bit awkward and just keep in mind that you're not going to be able to send straight up to the surface with this guy you've got to do it nice and slowly still if you've done a deep dive it might be needed that you do a short stop if you're going to do something like deco diving let's just assume that it's recreational so you can just skip your safety stop get him to the surface but because i've got no buoyancy control device it's gonna be hard to keep this guy on the surface you're gonna to have to start initiating rescue breaths hopefully you've got a buddy who can deploy this and be for you so you had a safe way to get to the surface beforehand Hopefully they can do the signaling for the boat by using a signaling device like a whistle or something to get the boat's attention. But you, until the guy gets onto the boat, you can't do proper CPR for them. And again, if this guy's just completely randomer and this is a client boat or you have other divers still in the water, the boat won't be able to leave and go back to the shore to give them proper emergency services help. They're gonna have to wait for all those other divers to get back on board and it can be sometimes a call the captain has to make if they're going to think, okay, we've got to look after this guy, we've got to go back to the shore, or it, and it might even cause them to cancel multiple dives that were planned for the rest of that day, which is a big frustration. It can be a big financial loss for the diving company. It's just a situation you don't want to happen. So I think the better option, which is my other option you can do, is take control of the situation. So what I mean by this is you're going to basically do what you've shown in the rescue course if you're taught properly. I'm just going to go over it now to make sure everyone's on the same page. But the idea is you want to get your alternate out, you want to make sure the hose is over your shoulder so it's got as much length as possible, and you want to make sure the mouthpiece is facing upwards, and you're going to have long straight arm, create as much distance between you and them as possible to deliver the air to them. Also turn your head slightly and give your other hand to protect your primary, that way then it's very clear, they're going to meant to breathe off the alternate and you're protecting your one. Just make sure when you turn your head, you're not doing like a massive turn so you can still keep an eye on them. That's very important. As soon as they take air and they start breathing off it, that's when you want to then make contact, but you're gonna do it more as like a panic diver situation. So you wanna wrap your legs around their legs to stop their legs from kicking and moving. And you wanna clasp their hands and ideally get just be holding by one hand, both of the hands together. And then you can make eye contact and then you can signal with your hands to start talking them through it. So if they are someone with zero experience about scuba diving, you can coach them through Breathe in, breathe out, and do that with the regulator. You can talk with a regulator in your mouth. It's just very muffled, but you can talk to some level, and it's better than just complete dead silence because it will help calm them a level to a bit. And once they get to breathing to a nice steady rate, you then want to end the dive. If you have a buddy, signal to them to deploy their DSMB to have a safe exit. And obviously at that point, if you can do a safe stop, great, but 
you can skip it. And especially if the guy has zero scuba diving experience, it might be better just to skip the safety stop as well because it might freak them out because you stopped halfway through your ascent. So just to let they know you are looking after them, take, you take them to the surface, it's all good. And then once on the surface, fully inflate and just get them to hold on to you. And once they're okay, you can have a full conversation on the surface and let them figure out a plan from there. But personally, I think just taking control of the situation is a lot better. But if you are someone who's not very confident in it, again, if they blindsided you, the best thing is just create distance. Don't try and have a conversation and be like, no, 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 don't come towards me, you need to go up. That's just gonna probably give a greater risk that they're gonna snatch your regulated mouth and make a bad situation for yourself. But if the person is in control, like in that guy's scenario, someone who's just goofing around, they're bit, being a bit cocky, that's fine to try and have a conversation with like, no, you're not having my air, just go away. That can be fine, but if it's a genuine person out of there, I would say it's better to just treat it like a rescue scenario and that way is better. But don't just let someone drown, like he said, because that it sounds like, oh, it's not my responsibility. But realistically, if you are in a position to save someone's life, I think you should do so. But also if you're in a position to stop even a rescue situation from happening, I think you should also do so instead as well. That's just my take on it all. And that is also our final video, guys. Um, if you like the video, give it a like, let me know you want to see more reactions. But reality is, these guys are the talents and the video today. They put all the hard work in, I'm just reacting to the videos. So I'm going to link all the videos down in the description. Check them out for yourselves, give them a like too if you like their videos, and even subscribe to them because they're making some cool content. I do agree for all these videos, even the last one where I have a bit of nuance to it. It's such a complicated topic that there's obviously going to be a discussion with that one. But yeah, really cool stuff. I love seeing the Scuba content creators doing stuff like that. Anyway, I've been Night Time, guys. Hope you guys are having awesome dives at the moment and staying safe in the water. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.